Uh, Liz Cowens was a geography teacher for over 30 years and also worked as the geography advisor for Newcastle Local Education Authority, winning an Excellence in Cities Award. She then went on to undertake numerous roles with the Usburn Trust. As an advisor and volunteer, Liz has helped schools to utilize the Usburn Valley as an educational environment through resource provision to enhance fieldwork opportunities. She also submitted various bids for funding within this role. She has worked as a tour guide for both Overland and Victoria Tunnel Tours. So she knows that the Usburn area very, very well. She's been an active and dedicated member of the GA uh, Tyne and Weir branch, providing themed workshop uh, for teachers using the Usburn uh, as a base for, for many years. So a very warm welcome to Liz. And then Kath, who will uh, take the second half of the session, uh, taught in, in secondary schools for 10 years, what was Whitburn Secondary Modern, and then Westo Comprehensive School in South Shields. Uh, she then taught geography at, at Northumbria University as a senior lecturer for 22 years, and is now a visiting scholar there. She was an incredibly successful chair of this branch from 2012 to 2020, and we're so pleased to have her and Liz uh, here to present to us today. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, Liz, you can share your screen. I'll switch my, uh, my sound off and uh, I'll just pop it. If there's any hitches or anything, um, uh, I'll, I'll be back to try and sort them out. But other than that, Liz, over to you. Right, I'm just, uh, I seem to have a, oh, there we go. View. And here we go. Right. Hello, everybody. Oh, is that all right, Brenda? Yeah. OK. Um, today we're going to be looking at the idea of the Usburn um, in a sort of timeline. The problem is that you tend to teach to exams. And one of the things we, we hope to do is to increase people's awareness of where the Usburn Valley is. I think if we, you were stop people in Newcastle and said, and where's the Usburn Valley? It could well be that they haven't a clue, but it's, it's actual um, popularity is, is growing quite greatly. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to just go back in time and look at various aspects as the valley developed. And usually what we do is we would, we would use say, where, when, how, what, why and then so what at the end. Um, so it's got lots of resources. Uh, I will be zipping through quite quickly. So hopefully um, it should be going okay. All right, then here we go. First question is where is the Usburn? And obviously it's a valley um, and it's to the east of Newcastle upon Tyne. The slide shows you uh, where, it, where it is approximately, and originally, obviously, it would have been cut off from the main city. If we look at it, it's, it's a river, starts up probably near the airport, near Black Callerton, it flows south, um, and it's to the east of the centre of Newcastle, through a valley. And this, this, this concept of a valley is important because it likens with, say, South Wales, where you had iron and steel and coal, in a very restricted environment. So it was signing its own death warrant in some senses. It has meanders um, towards the end and the meanders have actually shaped the structure of industry, settlement, people, housing, development over time. And we've got an aerial view here where you've got a modern view of the actual valley and you've got quite a number of bridges. There's three bridges to the south going towards near the mouth, but then there's three at the top, and the three at the top were, were very, very important. You can see that there's housing to the left and housing to the right, probably moving people out of the, the valley itself. Very bottom, you can see Spillers Quay where the, the big wheel should be going at some point, but we haven't really heard very much about that recently. The three valleys are important. 
And on the two areas to the west and the east, you've got housing where people have been moved out of the valley and you've got industry in the center and a nice little meander towards the mouth of the river. So a modern view is very different to what it would have looked like at the beginning, say so the end of the 1700s, the beginning of the 19th century. When I was teaching, I would ask people, I would ask my, my girls, when do you think this was? Oh, it ranged from Victorian times before that. And yet this was the used burn in the 1960s. It's a beautiful black and white. Um, in the front, you've obviously got uh, the culvert. Children used to play there. You've got housing, you've got the bridge in the background. And it was very typical of 1950s Britain and obviously it's the 1960s. So thinking about the industry, early development was all about, and here the words I've done them in different colors so they'll stand out. It was industrialization and it was coal and it was water and it was raw materials, but it was the river and it was the Usburn and the actual shape of the valley, which helped the, the industry to develop. Why, here I go with the, you know, where, why, what, how, was, does the shape of the valley con help control land use? Yes, it must do, um, because the river's winding and there are banks on either side where some of it's very steep and there are banks where there's flat land. Industry is going to take note of the flat land and therefore be built as close to the actual river as possible. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second because it was all about water transport. Old fashioned industries, for example, flour, seven stories, and the one on the right, which is Little Hensel Glassworks, depended on raw materials, especially the glassworks. It would get um, sand and it would get flints brought in on boats, which could be used to go into the pottery, uh, into the glass. It was one of the first areas to create windows for, for Britain. So it was very important. You'll see there that, that when the river goes out, because the river's tidal, you can see mud banks and detritus and all sorts of weird and wonderful things, including two men, three men standing in the middle of it. So factories located right next to the river. It was important. Why? Well, you had boats that could go up and down the river. The wherries, flat bottomed, could come up with the tide, bring stuff, be unloaded, go out with the tide with products. And these were an important form of transport. At the very mouth of the river, and you can see where is on the left, you had different bridges. And the bridges could not allow sailboats through. So the boats had to be pulled through. You see, it's very, very narrow, especially when you're on high tide. And then this is another nice black and white. You can actually see in the distance how shallow the water was because all the river, all the water had gone out with the tide. And the children in the middle standing in, I'm not sure what, I know it's mud, but it will be fairly um, obnoxious. They're trying to collect coal. On the right hand side, there's a wherry and that's linked nearby to the, the ironworks. And the river itself looks incredibly wide. Now this is, this is, well, I think it's quite important because if you look at the top left, that's the river today and it's very narrow. So what we've got to think about is, is, is it wide enough during the, the 19th century for where it is to cross? Yes, they were. But by the time it comes to the present day, there aren't any worries, they aren't used. There's no transport on the river. So what's happened to its width? it's not needed, it does, nobody needs it anymore. So where is no longer exist, and a lot of work, and this is where it comes more appropriate for your syllabuses, a lot of work's been done to regenerate the valley, to upgrade the riverbanks, to put in a walk, and it's pushed into the channel, and it makes it a lot, sharp, lot narrower. A lot of text on here, I'm sorry. But with the development of industry, industrialization, 
you got people coming into the area now hopefully next next session we'll be looking at the census and i'll be looking at some of the the ways in which you can look at census returns and it tells where people were coming from it also tells what people were doing what kind of jobs they did when they were living in the Usburn. So people were pulled into the Usburn and pushed from the countryside, bearing in mind the idea of the agrarian revolution with lots of use of machinery, different kinds of strains of crops, and people weren't needed to till the fields, etc. So they came into the Usburn and what did they do? Well, they worked in different kinds of industry and all those industries were heavy manual labor um, using basic raw materials, working on the river, shipbuilding, lead works, serious place, also called the white cemeteries, iron foundries, soap, bleach, uh, tanning leather, that smelled awful, uh, sawmills, corn mills, all sorts of different things. But the one thing about all of these and the interesting section is that you have got a linkage and there's links between them, a very short distance, which meant that you could save money on transport costs. And there is a parallel to say the South Wales, the valleys in the South Wales, when they were making steel, iron, etc. The area provided jobs where you've got jobs, you've got people, you've got terraces, you need a doctor, you have tenements, 15 public houses, always a plus. Um, because the water supplies were not terribly uh, potent, they were obviously contaminated. If you drank beer, then basically it had been boiled water, so that was good. It meant you were less likely to go down with some horrible disease. And linkage meant you could move materials between different industries. Maps are available for industrial linkage, apply. Um, information on the white cemeteries, you can apply for those as well. The agrarian revolution and infrastructure, a little bit of definition at the bottom. There's some nice little maps here which I've put on, but it shows where you've got housing, you've got factories, you've got the river and the transport, which leads its way right the way through all the big buildings on either side, which are your industries. You know that you've got the bridge at the top, you've got workers there, they can walk to work, you've got railways there, you've got the Quayside Railway going north to south, and you have a lot of factories. Factories meant jobs. Therefore, you have to have lots of housing. Unfortunately, the housing was not of a very great quality, and there were consequences. Consequences of industry can come with air pollution, they can come with land pollution, with water, and overcrowding, as we'll see when we talk about the census and the people and the, the situations that they lived in, you would often get families living in one rented room. Um, there wasn't any running water, so there would be no flush toilets. Uh, you would have a, an outhouse. Uh, and you had little men with a, with a handcart and they'd come and dig your toilets out at night. Wonderful way to live. Um, pollution was in the air. At one point, the Usburn, it was one of the most pop polluted rivers in Britain. Children managed to go to school maybe half a day. That sounds familiar. They had poor diets because there was no money for, for decent, uh, balanced diets, balanced food. And then over looking all of this were the conditions that people had to work in and the children worked when they were very young they worked in the flax factory the flax mill they worked in the lead works and they often became ill and died um, lizzie dowson was one of the famous ones where they took one of the the industries to, to court because of the, the condition she was living in and working in was just horrendous she was very young and it happened time after time. At the bottom, you've got SEEP, which is the effect from social, environmental, economic, and political terms. But eventually, something was going to change in the, in the valley because it was getting too crowded. We've got lots of little bridges. They're lovely. I mean, 
you can take a horse and cart across those, no trouble at all. But as industry became more um, competitive and the bigger, and you wanted economies of scale, then what happened, these bridges cut bank and the new Glasshouse Bridge and the old Glasshouse Bridge were all pulled down to where you had near the River Tyne. And then all of a sudden you had um, big bridges being built at the north and the viaduct, which was the railway, went from east to west. It didn't touch the valley. Materials were sent on trains. People were traveling on trains. There was a biker road bridge and the decline of the industry began partially from that. It started to decline. There were heavy manufacturing, was not competing, um, changed from coal to oil. Uh, many of these old factories had been abandoned. The lead works was abandoned. You can't have lead in petrol, you can't have lead in paint. And the cattle sanatorium, which was the big building where all the animals would go to see if they were healthy and not carrying horrendous diseases, was down on the West Bank, beyond the bridge, um, the bottom of Cut Bank. And it was, if you were, were healthy, unfortunately, you were driven out of the sanatorium and in, straight into the abattoir to be processed into a variety of different things. One of, one of which would be leather and the tanneries were at the top of Stepney Bank. By the 50s, 60s, um, I think bearing in mind that many of these, these buildings were well over 100 years old, you can see from this black and white, they were decaying. And this is Northumberland Leadworks, where you have the um, one of the engine rooms, engine uh, buildings, and it was all knocked down. 1930s and 60s, you had slum clearance. The houses were taken out of out of play. People moved by 1969. Green areas, trees to make it nicer. 1950s and 1960s, this is what you would see. The right-hand photograph is, is nice. Well, I think it's nice because it has toilets with the pigeon crease above and it shows your priorities, doesn't it? You have an area where you can get to your pigeons if you need to. Um, and you also have the toilets and you have water in your backyard. But the actual condition that these houses were in, were, were, it was dreadful because you can see the carpets out of the window you can see the window with a missing pane. It was just not acceptable for people to be living in these kind of areas. And it happened right the way across the industrial regions of Britain. And by 19, the 1940s, a lot of everything's gone. The housing, the industries have changed and it's all been dem demolished. So if you can think, you can just about see the engine um, housing there. So what do you do if you've got that and I'm an investor after all these years of industrial input and industrial production, would you invest in that area? And chances are the answer would be no. So the problems in the 60s and 70s, factors were abandoned. Is that deindustrialization? Is it decay? The labor force was moved out because the key side had changed. And the, the housing had been moved up onto the higher ground. It was polluted, ice source. Who on earth would invest in somewhere like this? And this is where we're coming into the, the real puller of regeneration. Urban regeneration means that rundown areas, heaven only knows the ooze burn was run down. And you wanted to improve the quality of people's lives and get them a job, make the environment nicer and increase the, the economic and social conditions for the people who were living and working there. To get this, you had to have housing, jobs, leisure, and get a better environment. The one thing about the Usburn is it's very popular and it's, it's a very nice area to live. It's, it's, it's its own little unit. So you could think that it's rebranded 
And this is one of the things that the Usborne Trust is very good at. It rebrands, it changes the image of the area because it provides a lot of services. Could it be seen as an urban village? Mm. A cultural quarter, maybe, uh, but it is very attractive. But the politics isn't usually too far away. The government realised that within Britain, there were areas which had been neglected. Areas usually are linked to a coal field, areas linked to smokestack industries, old fashioned industries which needed help. Legacy of the war, smashed up housing, poor infrastructure. Areas were encouraged to come up with a plan, a cunning plan to spend money to make the area better for the people and for the image of the region. So the Tyne and Weir Development Corporation was born and it linked in with Usburn Futures. To oversee the development of the valley, however, because of the, the, the smash down and build up environment on the quayside, um, the, the Usburn Trust wanted to try to protect the historical importance of the trust and it did so by becoming a, a trust, but also a development trust to breathe new life into the valley. And how did it do it? Well, the mantra of live, work and play and learn was very important. And you did have stakeholders. You had a lot of people who were interested in preserving the history of the valley itself. How do you do it? Well, Biker Wall created a good environment for people to live in. It, it was on top on the, on the eastern side, people were moved out of the valley into here. You even had um, hobby rooms where you could get the key and you could go along and you could do sewing. Or there were the, the famous make your own railways group where the only way you could get in is if somebody left. Um, the environment's nicer, there's green grass, there are trees very different to the actual bottom of the valley. In the top left, you've got the mailings and you've also got an image of uh, Lowersteinberg's yard. So housing was developing much better. All, all the old housing had gone. The houses there were old, rented, windows didn't fit, no indoor toilets, no running water, no bathrooms. The housing in Biker Wall was much nicer and the other area near St Anne's. But some people do live in the valley, people live at um, Farm View, that's near the bridges, um, there are flats within various buildings, there's also uh, some student accommodation on Stepney Bank, but the area, the big area, was the Igloo Housing for People development near the River Mouth, and you've got Malmo Key on the left, I mean, in our environment, to be walking around, it looks really quite nice, but maybe on a, a sort of windy, wet day in November, it might not be quite as nice. But the ideas are all about involving and improving the area for everybody concerned. Play, well, recreation. Originally, it was all about heavy manufacturing, but now, with the industries gone, we're definitely moving into tertiary. And unfortunately, this list, many of these will actually be closed now because of COVID. So the leisure sector employs a lot of people. The restaurants are attractive. The area is buzzing at weekends. It's busy during the night. There's all sorts of different industries, tertiary industries, and with uh, the toffee factory, quaternary. You have the stables you can ride, you have the farm where they have where they grow little crops, keep animals. Uh, only after, of course, they'd actually dug up the original farm because of the contamination from the lead works. But it now is a very, very attractive area and it's an eco building. If anybody's interested in doing eco buildings, that building is your man because it's, it's really built with a care for being environmentally friendly. And of course, you've got little animals at the bottom, big animals, and it attracts a whole raft of people to come in. 
the Victoria Tunnel originally started off as a coal tunnel, and that's in the valley as well. It was linked to um, a coal mine, uh, Spittle Tongues, and you had big chaldrons, big containers that came on tracks, rolling down gravity feed down to the river. Um, when that ended, it became an air raid shelter during the Second World War, um, because you did still have a lot of people living in the valley and they needed somewhere safe to shelter. Um, it can't have been easy because it was right underground. It was claustrophobic and cold, but it kept people safe. Pubs, whoa, lots of pubs, oh, sorry, lots of pubs, um, a nice meal, a nice evening. It's very attractive and it's very popular. You can also play on classes in Lime Street. Um, artists work in that building and they're in an apartment on the top floor. It's, it's, the, it's the real deal. It's everything there. Seven stories for the area of the books. You've got um, reading, which is, of course, very important, but it also hosts a lot of little exhibitions. And next to it, you've got the old flour mill. So it's been a conversion, but it's kept the, the, the feeling and the tradition of the flour mill at the right hand side, Leatham's flour mill. The late shows, that's your culture, where you've got lots of different activities. You've got buses that will take you around when it's permitted, of course. And you've got artists in residence, potters, glass makers. And that's the, the toffee factory. The toffee factory is an interesting building and it's it's crammed to capacity it needs it needs to expand and what do you get there well architects social media marketing web design it hires out places on a, on desks it's very very popular and obviously you know my own personal favorite is the um, the chocolates at the top but they don't make those anymore but they are really doing a good job um, if you look at the Toffee Factory website, there's lots of information on there to show you how it's developing and it's developed. You've got Northern Print. Today's industry is mainly small. It's got no massive machinery. It relies on techniques and people's talent. There's no heavy, bulky, dirty, raw materials. It deals with skill. It deals with IT and the environment is clean and the air quality is good. And the profile is raised constantly by startups, pop-ups, um, pubs providing different things. The Clooney provides music. Uh, there's music areas on the other side of the river. It provides all sorts of different industries to create an image and people love it. So hopefully it's a very quick timeline if you like of the, the valley itself images think about what you could use it for and Kath's going to come along now and talk about how you would actually answer a question specific examiners remember can always tell if you are waffling unfortunately but if you're confident when you're writing your answer you'll do really well so I'm going and I'm going to hand you over to Kath and Brenda. Is that it? Yes, uh, Kath, if you just want to start sharing your screen, please. Thank you, Liz. That was great. There's a few really useful comments coming through in the in the chat. Um, so Liz, if you want to have a, a look at so there's a couple of questions there. Will do. While, while Kath yes. does a bit. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very, very much. I seem to have your um, a, a list of uh, where did you hear from it on the screen. I don't know if that's... Yeah, you can minimise that. That's just the poll. So if anybody I... else hasn't answered the poll yet, that would be really useful right. for us just to see how you found okay, out then. about today. See you at the end, Liz. Okay. Right. Hello, everybody. 
and thank you, Liz, very much for such a vivid account of the Inspring Valley. I hope you'll all keep those pictures in mind while I'm talking, and it'll help you build up the picture of what I want to say. Before I start, I want to acknowledge the fact that this section has been written by John Smith, Chief Examiner of the AQA, and unfortunately, John couldn't be with us today, so he's left me a fantastic PowerPoint and notes, and I hope I do him justice. So it was John's idea as an AQA examiner to bring in this idea of a super case study to help both students and teachers, and as you can see here, increasing the payoff from your learning. And he suggests, and, and I certainly felt like this as an A-level student, do you ever feel that you have too much stuff to learn for geography exams? Could you organize your learning time more efficiently? And this is his idea. The idea of a super case study so that you can use this case study for different parts of the syllabus. He also says, that it would be useful to just target different parts. And I'll show you how he suggests that we do this in terms of place and in terms of urbanization. And really what he's going to do and what I'm gonna go through with you is this idea of adapting your super case study to fit different possible essay topics. And he's got a particular exercise that I'm going to go through with you, where he's got what are called factoids. He's got a number of different facts about the Eastburn. And I'm going to suggest how some of them could be used to answer one A level question. And if there's time, how some could be used to answer another. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> What John is very keen, as I say, to make things much easier for you is to have these ideas of a super case study that will also help you to link between topics because as he, as chief examiner, only knows too well that examiners want to see this intertopic link. And I'll show you how we can do that. Again, this exercise that I'm going to do with you Sorry, is to show you how you do this super uh, case okay. study. Right. And because of the particular way he structured the exercise, he suggests that you do it again and again to answer all sorts of different questions and says familiarity leads to facility. So he asks, how you can actually develop the Oosburn as a super case study for an A-level examination question. As I say, he works for the AQA board, but your boards, the other boards will have very similar questions on place and urbanization. So, so this isn't just directed at one board in, in particular. He looked at the specifications for the physical geography. Yes, you could perhaps use the Oosburn for water cycles in particular, but obviously not for the hot deserts or the glacial systems really. But he does suggest that you could use the Oosburn for the section ecosystems under stress. And this is how he suggests it is done. He says it's a bit of a tenuous link, but Northumberland Wildlife Trust have tried to do some reclamation work on the river, fixing plant containers in the river. And you can see those if you go to the mouth of the river, designed to rise and fall with the tide. And if you were interested in finding out more about that, Northumberland Wildfire Trust are the people to contact. And there's a photograph here of sorting out these rafts of plants. But what John would say 
is that the Usburn is very useful indeed for the human geography part of the A-level specifications. Yes, maybe global governance to a very limited extent, but very much it could be used for changing places, for the contemporary urban environment and for population in the environment. And a little bit perhaps on resource security. I'm just going to very quickly show you the different things that the place section of the A-level spec requires. It's wanting to talk about place and the importance of place in human life and experience, insider and outsider perspectives on place that we have information on, um, talking about near places and far places. And what we are thinking of is the Usburn being used as a near place for, for teachers in the Northeast. Looking at endogenous and exogenous factors, the Usburn can be used for that. It can be used very much for this idea of relationships and connections also in terms of meaning and representation, very much uh, seen in the advertising of the Usburn. And also the ways in which your students' own lives and those of others are affected by continuity and change. So there's all sorts of resonance in these A-level specs. Also resonance in terms of linking the place with demographic, demographic and cultural characteristics or economic change and social inequalities. And at different scales and throughout different time periods. We also, as part of the A-level, there is a section called contemporary urban environments. And again, you can see that you could use the Usburn really to illustrate some of these themes in terms of economical, social, technological, political, and demographic processes, for example, in terms of deindustrialization that we've talked about, or rather Liz has talked about, and in terms of regeneration, which she has. There's an interplay of the physical and human factors. And again, we've glanced on that in terms of looking at it as a river valley and how the, the, the sort of human factors interacted, the, the, the processes of human factors took place within the river valley. And you can see again from the new urban landscapes, how important cultural and heritage quarters are and will have resonance in terms of talking about the used boom. And economic inequality, we saw that in the past, and I'm hoping to be able to just point you in that direction in our exercise. And then there are other things connected to the urban specifications in terms of urban waste and urban environmental issues. And again, you could use the Usburn for that, but you would need to find out a lot of detail upon it. You could also look at it in terms of the population section of the A-level spec. And really it is very detailed, the population specification, but you could talk and you could talk about and link the Usburn to issues of population health and well-being, issues of economic development and the role of the natural environment. So generally, the, basically, um, the Usman can be used as a case study, a lot for the sections on place, but also a lot for the section on, on urban life, but other, other sections as well, such as resource development, you could talk about coal mining and for example the natural resource development over time so you can link it to all sorts of parts of it now 
what I wanted to do now was to stop this PowerPoint and then go on to um, to talk about um, John's exercise. If I look. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> just just got my documents not very well done. What John has done is to really segregate a number of questions that you could use the Usborne for. And as you can see, there are 12 here. I want to tackle question two, and then if I have time, I could race through question eight. So question two is, to what extent have changing economic characteristics affected people's lived experience of a local place you have studied. We can't see the questions, Kath. Ah. You, you're sharing uh, what looks like your um, or your documents rather than the document itself at the moment. Oh dear! Right. Have you got it open? I, I have got it open. Here we go. Let me try again. I'll, uh, I'll find it on my drive as well, oh, and nice. I might be able to share it. Mm -hmm. You want the titles, yeah? Yes. Okay. So basically, as I say, John has produced these titles, which we can send round to you, which would be useful for either teachers or or sort of A-level students to answer all sorts of different types of questions that might come up basically in terms of place or in terms of the urban experience. Thank you, Brenda. So that's You're very welcome. Cool. So here he has 12, as I said before, and what I want to do is to look at question two, which is to what extent have changing economic characteristics affected people's lived experience of a local place you study? What John decided to do was to give students these particular A-level questions and then to give them these ones, or this, these, this sheet. And again, we have the factoids. Could I, could I have the factoids, Brenda? We have a list of Usborne factoids. So he has basically collected a, a lot of different facts about the Usborne and numbered them. And what he wants to, to people to do in order to be able to create a super case study framework, basically, is this. Um, examine the question and then go through the factoids and just segregate the ones that, are, that will answer that question. And he sees that as a very useful structural tool to be able to create practice um, A-level answers, basically. So if we have a look at question two, which was to, to what extent have changing economic characteristics affected people's lived experience? 
of a local place, i.e. the Usman. Before I actually talk about the different factoids, I would suggest that as students, you would very much define what you meant by changing economic activities, literally examine the question. And then I would go through the, fa the factoids, if you can have the factoids up, Brenda. Can you and see? I, and how I'd structure the A-level answer would be to find those talking about the early economic development of the Usburn, and then talking about the change. Now we've seen very much this it in in photographs from Liz's talk. So, for example, were I to be answering that question, I would suggest that I'd look at F two, for example, just giving a background to it, and. not moving here. I can move it. Do you want me to scroll yeah. down, Kath? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Basically, I would look at F2 and then F5. So you would see both the coal and then the 19th century industries, and then add to it, give the whole a, a more full picture, F3. I would go back to F3, talking about the flat land being next to the River Tyne allowing easy buildings of factories. Yes, we are able to get um, copies of the factoid sheets and the questions and we will be sending them out. Um, then I would move on to F F6, Brenda, please. Sure, let me just uh, remove that. And moving to industry changing because we're talking about the economic structure and as i say liz has also sort of shown us very interesting photographs of it so i talk about the historical sections and then i would get my students to consider f6 for example as industry change and then I would start talking about the 20th century changes in F7 and in F9. When we're talking about the Tiny New Development Corporation, for example, and in F16. Excellent, thank you. Um, so really, John's idea was that you would have these factoids, get your students to cut them up really almost, give them an A-level question, get them to choose which factoids went with them with that particular question, and then use it as a framework. So anyway, what I've talked about is the early industries using those factoids, and then the, the the modern development using F7, 9, and 16. Then I would talk about, so, so if you like, those two being the background, I would examine the second part of the question. How has this change affected people's lives and, and lived experience of the area? So I would go back to F8, And again, you can see here, we're talking about the packed, closely packed housing. And if you like, you're using a kind of imagination of what it would have been like. Then on F9, when you're talking about the Tyne and Weir Development Corporation being set up, there's the idea of change and bringing in derelict land. And then if we go down, to F12 here, you've got the Spillers site, but interestingly, this analysis on the factoid for F9 is some possible fo 
some possible positives, but some immediate negatives. And then if we go down to F15, please. Um, then they're talking about what's happening now and housing bringing in a new younger demographic. Also, this is echoed in F17, St. Peter's Basin aimed to attract a young dynamic demographic. And then finally, if we have a look at F19, um, you've got what there actually is there as um, Liz has given us photographs of seven stories, for example, in the pubs and the gig venues. So basically, if we're talking about people's lived experiences, we're talking about a transition from 19th century, very almost areas of deprivation, very packed housing, to the entire other end of the spectrum to having young dynamic demographics. But really, what I would say were you to be answering an A level question, look again at the question and it says, to what extent? And I think, as if you like the end of the question, you need to sit back and think, to what, it, what does to what extent mean? And you need to give us your own opinions on things like, F8, for example. Could we, sorry to move this to and fro. What was it like to live in those crowded areas? And then to move on to F13, please. to when it's talking about some of the negatives affecting local residents. So we're talking about people's lived experiences and actually they're not all the young dynamic demographic at all. You need to look at the whole picture. You need to question the whole picture. So how does that affect lived experience? How does that, and then, if we look at F17, again, these are very, very useful factoids, but I would always be questioning them. So here we are uh, talking about young and dynamic demographic, but you know, are they the only people living here? Who else is living here? And why aren't they mentioned in, in these different um, factoids? And then finally, if we're talking about lived experience, so I'm saying examine all the people that are living there, we also need to look at F20 and 22 because we're not just talking in general terms about what it's like to live there, but it's other things that these factoids are sort of adding to our answers. For example, in F20, this idea of being short in park, of parking spaces, any new developments relying on public transport and how that would work in people's experience. And also in F22, this idea of not just looking at industry, not just looking at roads, but also just looking at, if you like, the whole picture again. What about waste disposal? How will that work? And how will that be planned for within the new development? So it, this particular question, I think, is a very interesting question, very wide ranging. It can very well be um, helped by the factoids and it's quite a kind of quite a nice game if you like to have in class the questions and the different factoids and people working in groups and figuring out which factoids would go with which question 
I suppose what are just a couple of words of warning. Yes, the factoids are very useful, but do please analyze them ex exactly what they're saying. And, and secondly, use that as a framework and you will need all sorts of statistics and other information to add to your question. But I think this has been a very interesting way of bringing A-level questions to life. And I hope it'll give some people some ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kath, that's, that's wonderful. I'll just stop uh, sharing my screen and uh, we'll go to, uh, to questions. I haven't been able to see uh, much in the way of the chat while I've been sharing my screen, uh, yeah. but we'll, we'll go to, to Liz first. She's had a, a chance, I think, to, to look at, at some of the, the questions. Just a reminder, um, You've obviously signed up for to, to attend today through um, Amy Girdle Stone, our secretary. She has copies of those uh, questions and the, the factoids, and uh, she can send them to you. So you've got your own paper copies. I see a few of my learners on, on this uh, meeting this afternoon, and I've got copies already for you um, that I can give you on Wednesday when I see you next. Um, so lots of useful comments and questions, I think, that have that have come through. Um, do keep uh, adding them in. Um, and uh, Liz, can I hand over to you to, uh, to to answer some of the questions that came through while Kath was talking? And yeah, if, sure. if there's anything that's really sort of, you know, going to take ages, we can perhaps do it by email. And so there's lots of ways of approaching them. But, uh, you know, just in the interest of time, we're, we're just after five o'clock. So, you know, try and get through this in about in about sort of 10 minutes would be would be fabulous. OK, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank goodness for that. Um, there was one question which came through about uh, the use burn and definition of boundaries. Well, for the for the process of um, using it as a, as a case study, it was very much just the use burn valley as it is not necessarily the areas round the edge um so mm -hmm. it was it was a very broad picture broad strokes of of what the Usburn valley was like um i'm not aware i i assume that uh, the other thing was about slum clearance that it was a policy um even in manchester and rochdale where i'm from as you can probably tell um that that the 30s were designed to, to knock down housing and the 60s and the 70s that occurred there as well so it would probably eventually move right the way through Tyneside and all the old houses which were horrendous would have been actually demolished and cleared out of the way. Um, Holt's Yard uh, mailing started on the edge of the of the Usburn of the river um, it moved out to Ford A and Ford B and it moved, the production of pottery moved out to Holt's Yard. Now, it doesn't necessarily link into the Usburn because it isn't actually in the valley. And I think that's what we were going for at the time. Isn't that right, Brenda? We were looking at the, the valley itself as opposed to the area around it. Um, and that's why it wasn't included. The uh, idea of census data, um, Next week, hopefully, we're going to do the census uh, using census data. My bit would be uh, specifically looking at uh, what people did and using census data linked in with maps and with photographs for specific locations. I've designed a transect which we're going to use, um, and there'll be certain points picked out to identify what kind, what was happening to people in the area, what were they doing for jobs, how many people lived within one room, a tenement, Brown Jug Yard, um, on Ooze Street and Lime Street. Um, so for me, my source for the, for the census is old, and it was a 1911 census, and I've got uh, specific sheets for different families living in one or two rooms at those three locations, one on Stepney Bank, one on Lime Street, and one on um, the Ooze Street. 
primarily because if we're, if we're thinking about encouraging students with ideas for personal, personal studies and personal field work, then all of this is actually um, secondary data, isn't it? That's right, isn't it, Brenda? Sorry, I'm oh, reading. Yeah. I'm reading chats as I go. Sorry, what was the, the oh, question? Right, but basically, it, it's it's my aim or hope to be able to. Is this next week? Yes. To yes. Give well, there'll be posters and things go out. Amy's got it. We're pretty much ready to go on that, I think. But there was a question about census data. Yes, I've already answered to, to that. So I've suggested data oh, right. shine, for example, is a good source to use for, yeah. for contemporary or nomis web. But there'll, there'll be a lot of information next week. For, we'll yes. run that at four. Obviously That's going to be Kath yeah. and I think Peter Glaves is online this afternoon. Hello, Peter. Oh, Thank hello. You for agreeing to, to get involved with that. It's great. Looking forward to yes. it. Oh, so he is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so so I think that was. Um, I didn't know anything about um, any racial inequalities. Um, yes, and it, is, is that that's probably me done, isn't it? Right. Yeah. The, the only thing that I thought about the racial inequalities, Liz, was when we did a tour with you quite some time ago, you talked about the differences between religions and how the oh, Catholics yeah. oh, kept yeah. very much to themselves and the chapel folk kept very much to themselves. And that was sort of, you know, almost, you know, the, those sort of groups of people um, was very much sort of uh, divided, you know, in, in the Usburn area way back when. In, in, you know, perhaps less so now. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Any other questions, or especially for Kath? We've we've heard uh, some, for, you know, but but for from either of the sessions, I'm hoping that you've, uh, you know, been able to see how you could do like a card sort. Uh, where you cut mm. the factoids up, you know, brilliant, well done, Kath. It's really difficult sometimes to present somebody else's work, but that was really clear, uh, yeah. I yeah. thought. Um, if there are any other questions about that, now is your chance just to pop them in that chat. Um, and uh, we'll just 